Hello. Okay. Conversation number four, I think, uh, today. Um, Manny's Super Civic Cyber Conversations, and welcome to the folks who are tuning in now. Um, my name is Manny Akutial, and we are hosting these conversations to civically engage the public in a time of need. And I'm so honored and excited that my friend Patrick Ayask, who is joining us today. Um, but before we start, a couple housekeeping notes. One, if you have a question for Patrick, you can just go ahead and type it into the Q&A box at any time. Number two, um, we are also asking folks to become sponsors of Manny's to help my small business make it through this time. So there's a link in the chat box, which I can't see right now, um, that you can click on to become a sponsor of Manny's. It's $36 and we really need your help. Patrick, are you there still? Or did I lose I'm you? I'm ready. Hi. So you're the senior biosecurity <laughs> at, not, you're not a senior, but you are, <laughs> you are the senior security, biosecurity fellow at the Chan Zuckerberg Biosecurity Pro Hub, Biohub? Biohub, yeah. Okay, so what is the Biohub? And then also, what does it mean that you're the senior biosecurity fellow? What does that involve? Awesome, sure. So the, the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub is very similarly named to the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, but separate. <laughs> we get that all the time. But it's a um, biotech research institute, essentially, that's working on more cutting edge stuff that might not necessarily attract uh, federal research dollars, but would still mm -hmm. do a lot of good in the world. Uh, mm -hmm. I joined the Biohub about five or six weeks ago. Um, very exciting time for me to switch over. Uh, my yeah, background wow. epidemiologist and veterinarian. Um, I've spent years studying emerging diseases and dealing with um, outbreak response and building surveillance systems, both for mm -hmm. the CDC and California Department of Public Health and the private sector as well. Um, and then in the Biohub, really part a lot of my role uh, there the, the expectation was for it to be to um, bring a lot of the technology that they're developing into the public health and global health sector um, mm. it's, a non -profit. it's um, really wanting to target vulnerable populations as well um, and given the timing of when i joined most of what i've been dealing with is coronavirus to this point so what exactly are you doing for coronavirus like what's your what's your day-to-day -day job look like right now yeah, so my day-to-day -day job has been a bit all over the place. So the Biohub has um, been helping UCSF Clinical Laboratory expand into a high-throughput testing lab space um, in the Biohub's building. Um, so that's been kind of an all-hands-on-deck effort for the last two weeks or so. Um, and that's to, get, that's to get coronavirus testing to help people who need to be yeah. tested. Okay, yeah. more questions on that in a second, but yes, keep going. Yeah, so, you, so um, as you all have probably seen, and everyone knows quite a bit about coronavirus at this point, but testing has been a limitation on us being able to mount an effective response. Um, so we, we've been looking for ways for research institutes to be able to contribute to diagnostic testing as well. It's a different mm -hmm. set of standards, different set of regulations, but... Um, finding ways to be able to leverage a lot of that high throughput capacity that sits places. So I feel like I'm getting somewhat conflicting information as just an average Joe or Jane right now, which is some people are saying like, we, we still need to ramp up testing, like testing is the most yeah. important thing. And some people are telling me like testing's over, like it's, there's no point, like testing's not the thing we need to be focused on right now. It's getting ventilators and, respirators and, and hospital capacity. What's the truth? And the, maybe the, specifically for the Bay and then maybe more generally. Yeah, yeah the, the truth is uh, you, we, we need to walk and chew gum at the same time. The, the, both of those are critically important. There, there's no way around that. Um, it, we, we need to ramp up testing sufficiently. Um, one way to think of a shelter in place order like we're all under now, um, the, is essentially us saying we don't really know who's infected. We don't have the capacity to test everybody. So everybody act as if you're infectious for a few weeks, a month, six weeks, um, and let's see how far that gets us and essentially allows us time to build those systems where we could test people effectively, get ventilators, hospital capacity in place. 
Um, so when more cases do start showing up, um, we're well equipped to be able to manage those. So the shelter in place stuff is not to keep people from spreading it. It's to basically slow down the existing spread so that the hospitals can keep up for when it does spread a lot? It, it, it's both of those. So the, um, the, the, maybe to take one step back, I think everybody probably knows at this point, but we don't have an identified effective treatment for coronavirus to this point. We don't have a vaccine in place. Um, so without those tools at our disposal, there's a couple things that we know are tried and true and work pretty well in public health. Um, and all of those really come back to a couple things. But the large overarching one is taking people who are infectious and removing them from the general population as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. So we have a few strategies of doing that. Um, a lot of these people are starting to get more familiar with the lingo, the, the, which is fun for me to see in some ways <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> i've been working i feel in. like ev everyone knows what ppe is now like everybody is familiar with ppe you probably know what contact tracing is but um th things like contact tracing isolation and quarantine are incredibly important um so the the idea being like isolation is when someone is infectious and you're setting them a, an apart from the general population so they can't infect anyone. Mm -hmm. Quarantine is essentially you've been exposed to the disease, but you aren't demonstrating the illness yet. But you're yeah. saying, I'm gonna stay home because there's a possibility I could start being infectious soon. Um, and then c contact tracing is I, making the links between those two. Yeah, so yeah. We've identified a case, let's figure out everywhere they went in the last three days and let all of those people know they should be staying home. Okay, um, I, have, uh, I have so many questions for you, Patrick. Okay. <laughs> I keep bouncing around in my brain, but the, the, the question that just came to mind is, you know, everyone's saying like it's going to be 12 to 18 months before there's a vaccine. And yeah. I'm like, what takes so long? Like the whole world is focusing on this one thing. Like yeah. if everyone just gets their shit together and focuses on getting a vaccine, does it really have to take 18 months? Like what the hell? Yeah, un unfortunately it does. Um, so, and there's a couple of reasons for that. So you may have seen the, um, uh, the, the drugs that President Trump has been trumpeting um, all over the place mm -hmm. did get a rapid approval to be used um, in a clinical setting from the FDA. Mm -hmm. we, that option doesn't really exist for a vaccine. And there's some good scientific and medical reasons for that. Um, and I would love to hear them. Yeah, so in, in the example of that drug, the, that's been a malaria drug that's been around a long time. We, we know its safety pro profile, we know what it looks like. If yeah. you take it orally, it's out of your system in a day or two. Um, vaccines are quite different. Um, they're going inside of your body. They're hanging around for a long time, and they're intended to manipulate and, and change your infectious response in the long term. Mm -hmm. so the vaccines can have bad outcomes. Um, the, so they you, they have to go through rigorous testing. They're just as right. a way around it. So, but like, but just but more in, just to be clear, what it means is like they're coming up with some ideas and they test it through different animals basically and see what happens. Yeah. So it, actually, for one of the first times ever, they're doing they're skipping that animal step with this. So they are actually starting to get some vaccines in humans essentially as of last week. Um, and those happen in different stages. And that first stage is just, hey, let's put this vaccine in 10 people and watch them for three or four months and be sure everything is going in the right direction. Um, and then they'll expand that to bigger groups to try and see if it's actually working or not. And do you think that that procedure is necessary given how quickly this is spreading and how crazy it's affecting the whole world yeah yeah i i, I, I it, you really have to like I, I don't see another option um the we 
unlike drugs that we've had around for a long time where we do know that safety profile, if we wanted to talk about going and doing a max vaccination campaign in, in hundreds of millions of people, you really have to have strong confidence that 1% of people aren't going to have a terrible reaction to it. Right, because then it's like, what's the point? If if one percent of people are dying from COVID and one percent of people die from the vaccine, you're not actually helping. Exactly. So, so let's go to respirators. Then I want to go yeah. to the surge. <laughs> right, let's go to respirators. Then let's go to the surge. Then then let's go to just kind of long term thinking. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, and folks, if you have questions for Patrick, he's like super smart. Like I said senior biosecurity fellow at the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub. So start typing in your questions now, if you have them. Um, so respirators, uh, what's the difference between a respirator and a ventilator? One, two, did we not have enough of them anyway? Or it, we never were gonna have enough of them for a time like this? And three, is there a way to like build them super quickly? Or a lot of people are talking about like 3D printing them, makerspace yeah. making them, like, like is, is it, is what, how hard is it to make a lot of these very quickly to come up with the extra? Yeah, so all, all good questions in there. Um, oh, the, thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate it. Of course, I'm happy to answer all of them. <laughs> I'm prepared, I'm ready. Um, so the, you, when you hear people talk about respirators, that typically means the N95 mask that term people are probably familiar with now but essentially it's a mask that creates a seal around your breathing space so any air you're taking in has oh. to pass through this very fine filter oh and maybe i meant ventilators i think i meant ventilators yeah so the ventilators are what, what's helping you breathe when you're having trouble breathing essentially um so those are you've all seen movies of icu stuff or whatever yeah. but that's the machine that helping you breathe when you're too sick or and, that, and that's the thing we have a massive shortage of right yeah, of both of those um so the the ventilators have gotten a lot of media attention and they're they're a known choke point um when you hear our president say that no one could have known this was the case that that's just patently false but every how, how so Everyone who's worked in this space has known that would be a limitation of any major respiratory. That, so when you were when you were an epidemiologist at UCSF, and I asked you, "Hey, do we not have enough ventilators in case there's a big flu outbreak?" You would have told me, "Absolutely." Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's the the expectation essentially. So how? And why was that? Why was nothing ever done about that? So the the few different answers there. So it, that's entirely reasonable. For a hospital to just maintain the resources that they need for their standard operating. There is a strategic national stockpile at the federal level that stores additional ventilators to deploy for regional needs, but it, it's been an identified need all along that if something was going to go national um, or the truly pandemic that you would need to scale up production of those pretty rapidly. Mm -hmm. uh, and do you know where that those sto has that stockpile been deployed? It's it's very hard to get answers on that currently. Um, Why? I <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're that guessing. seems like a really important question. It does. Um, so the, I had an I had an ER doctor last night call me from UCSF. And she was asking, she asked me, she's like, hey, Manny, how can we, ER doctors, yeah. advocate to get the ventilators from the federal stockpile? Like, what's the, what's, the pro, what's the lobbying process for that? An ER doctor asking me. And I'm like, you shouldn't have to lobby the federal government to deploy those resources to you. You're, sure, you're on the front lines. You know what I mean? And it, it's, it's been completely piecemeal and, and scattered. It, it's, yeah. The, the lack of cohesive federal response has been shocking. Um, but the, in, in answer to your question, the, what, what's in the strategic stockpile and where the stockpile even is are both confidential. So mm -hmm. I don't know, most people I talk to don't know. Okay. Um, but the, we have a general sense that there's about 12,000 to 20,000 ventilators in that stockpile. 
um, and the best messaging we're getting on where those are going and when are coming from Trump's tweets and press conferences. Unfortunately, Got it. we're not getting more granular information on that. And, and the la I, my last question on ventilators was: um, so many people are talking about like. 3D printing them, makers making yeah. them, kind of like people being able to find interesting ways to make them. Do you think that's actually reasonable or is that not really gonna go anywhere? Uh, it, it could, um, it, it'll take a little bit of time because they're, okay. all, they're all medical equipment. They need to be regulated before you put a loved one on this machine, you need to be confident it's going to work. Um, right. so that's, there, there are some timeline limitations there. What some people are working on, and, and the Biohub is working on this a bit too, is essentially taking outdated um, ventilators that maybe don't have the newest bells and whistles that automatically monitor the patient or whatever, but essentially adding that capability on with yeah. some, a rapid prototype. Yeah. Um, and the, something like that, I think, has a lot more promise in the short term, or yeah. essentially adding functionality to something that was already working it's just a bit out of date so we so folks who do are tuning in uh we're gonna we started a little bit late because i was having my internet just went out right when we were about to start so i'm gonna ask one or two more questions and then we're gonna get to your questions as well so the surge everyone's talking about the surge and of course um of course you know we just have found out today that the six counties are going to continue shelter in place until may 1 the information that i saw had the surge that might happen here will be April 25th. That's the projections um, or somewhere in mid to late April. Um, but like, so one, is that the operating information that you're working off of? A, and B, like, is it, are we necessarily gonna have a surge or is it possible that we shut it down quickly enough that we may not have one? Yeah, so the, what we're hearing thus far from the hospitals is we're staying relatively flat and even in the San Francisco area that with the possible exception of Santa Clara County. Um, and that's quite divergent from New York, for example, that looked quite similar to us two weeks ago. Um, and at the time, you know, no one could have told you that this is how it would have shaken out. I'm sure that there's some random chance in that. But it seems like we, we in the Bay Area did institute the lockdown a few days earlier than New York. And it seems like we caught stuff at a pretty decent time. Um, so we, we might not see that same type of surge um, as long as we continue to take these preventative measures. So I guess um, that's, the, that's the question. Almost, if, yeah. But, if but we if don't see the surge. Our normal stuff um, yeah. daily basis then you would see that surge. Okay, I know this is a very maybe off-color thing to ask yeah. or say, but like if the Bay Area did do it right and, and shut it down early enough to prevent a surge of cases yeah. and a lot of deaths, eventually though, we, we are gonna need to get back to work and our small businesses are gonna need to reopen if they're ever gonna reopen and our schools are gonna to need to reopen. Uh, and so the question is, do you think then what we do is we reopen the bay, but shut down the state in a way that, is, that prevents folks who are infected from coming in and making all of those efforts worthless? Yeah, and that's, I did, the, I did, there's a lot more uncertainty for me in where things go from here than I did, I, everything that's happened at this point, I, I feel like I've been able to see a week or two into the future pretty easily. Mm -hmm. um, at, at this point, it, it largely becomes a political question. Um, Interesting. Th this is uncharted territory. You know, we haven't had to think about federal versus state quarantine authority in the United States in a very long time. Wow. Um, it, it's, it's an area of law and politics that isn't well fleshed out either. Um, there's a lot of ambiguity in who holds what rights. Um, beyond, uh, mo for the most part, particularly in yeah. California, it's the county um, or, or local that holds that. Okay, um, I'm gonna get to focus. But, oh, um, I'll let you finish. Yeah, it, it, it just, it, you know, I, it's hard for me to guess what, um, what our federal government is gonna wanna do, particularly with, some people on the further right starting 
um, to advocate that we should open everything back up. Um, just, just hard to know where stuff will land on that. It does seem that like there does get to a point where the political and the public health might start to get at odds with each other because right now the political winds are shut it down, stop and flatten the curve. At some yeah. point, you know, if the curve has been flattened in a certain part of the country, let's say, you know, with God's help or all of our help and God, if you believe in God, we flatten the curve. <laughs> then, 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 then it becomes a question of like politically. Then what do you do to to get back to work and in a way that doesn't endanger people too much. All right, I want to get to folks' questions. Um, Nick Rosenthal was the first question. It was going to be how I ended it, so I might as well ask his question, which is, what do you think the end result of COVID-19 will be? Like, if you had to kind of give your predictions of how this will all end up, what would you say will be the arc of this story? Yeah, so the, there's a few different options on the table, though if I had to guess, and this isn't the only option, maybe just to stay to none of the options are apocalyptic and you, you know that's um the, it, the worst case scenario in some ways is um we're, we're already getting glimpses of how that could play out in different places but um the, wait, one of the things that's interesting to me as a biologist is that this looks very much like it, this could be what it looks like when a new common cold emerges for example, like mm -hmm. a, the coronaviruses that circulate regularly in the human population cause colds that we've all had at different points of our lives. They tend to be much more mild in younger people. And then secondary infections after your immunity wanes after a few years tend to be pretty mild too. Um, so that may well just be a feature of general natural history of coronaviruses too, where we're looking at viruses that tend to have much worse outcomes in older populations, but are infectious enough that most people contract them when they're young. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're seeing a lot of um, those bad impacts on this initial phase of it spreading around the globe. And then most people will either have been exposed and have another infection that isn't as virulent, yeah. uh, or they're getting exposed when they're children, as yeah. new decades from now, it's just circulating. Um, yeah. that, that's all conjecture. Um, okay, but, we, have, we have a lot of questions, so I'm gonna try to get to them. Will wants to know what are the sources of information that you're getting that you trust? Because it does seem like a lot of the information is being filtered through a political lens. So where are you getting your info from in a manner that you trust? So the, if you want information on um, what you should be doing uh, kind of at a granular level around the outbreak, the county health departments are great places to go. Um, we have a lot of, we, we have particularly strong public health departments in the Bay Area. So whoever the, um, oversees your jurisdiction, it's a great place to go. You can just find it on Google. Um, I, I've been very impressed with the New York Times coverage as well. Um, the Washington Post too has been doing a great job. Um, New, New York Times it has been really remarkable in the extent of what they've been able to cover. Um, if you want something a little more granular or specific, the Center for Health Could, could be relatively soon. Um, they, they already have some out on the market in China. Germany's rolling one out through their mm -hmm. government um, mm -hmm. very soon. I'm not sure the exact timeline, but on the order of weeks. Um, and I expect we'll start seeing some in the US quite soon as well. And what exact, what does that mean, an antibody test? Yeah, what, what antibody does that mean? tests. So the, the tests that we're talking about for diagnosing people typically are looking for pieces of the virus. Whereas the antibody is looking for evidence that you were ever previously infected. I see. I um, see. Okay. It's very valuable in these types of settings because we can say 
okay, I, I, I had a, something that felt like the flu two weeks ago and stayed home. Um, mm -hmm. I wasn't able to get tested. I don't know if I had coronavirus or not, but the antibody mm -hmm. test would be able to say, oh, you've had it, you're immune, go back to work, feel safe. You, you be the person from your household that's going to the grocery store, um, identifying people that can start to live closer to a more normal life and support elements in society. Awesome. Jim wants to know, uh, Novartis announced today that the malaria drug is that, that the malaria drug is helpful with people with COVID-19. Is that accurate? I actually haven't seen that today. So <laughs> I'm not sure. I, as of yesterday, there, there really hasn't been much evidence around it at all. Essentially, we, the, the one little study out of France had a lot of issues with it that, um, the, yeah, and obviously Novartis has, is kind of biased, isn't it? I, I, I'm, I'm not sure who holds the pat, patent on it, actually. But, oh, okay. Yeah, I'll, right, I'll be... Um, we're going to keep moving. We've got a lot of questions and not a lot of time. Do you <laughs> FEMA wants to know, do you envision a second wave in the fall? Would there be likely another shelter in place down the road before a vaccine is available? Yeah, a lot of us are worried about that. What are you thinking, Patrick? Yeah, I, I think there's definite possibility for that. Um, it, it's not clear what will happen in the summer. A lot of respiratory viruses like these are seasonal, um, but it's not clear when you have most respiratory viruses, we've also all had at some point. So we're not as susceptible. When we, you have an entire world of susceptible people, um, the summer may not be enough to actually reduce that to a point that we don't need to worry about it. Um, but it, if we do see some effect from summer, then we would expect to see additional waves in the fall. Um, and much like Manny, you were saying earlier, I, I think a lot of the decisions around those lockdowns or quarantine shelter in place um, will start coming more and more at the local level. Um, do we? Do you know when in the fall the second peak would come? If it, if it were to happen in the fall, we really don't. So the the respiratory pathogen we see with seasonal effects, they all tend to stagger a little bit, it, tending to be in fall or winter, but mm -hmm. we really have no, no signal on where this would fall in that. Joanna has a specific question about what's involved in the test for COVID-19 and what exactly are the specifics of the shortages we're facing? Is it one part of the test that we have a shortage of what's hold, or, or like what exactly is holding it up with the testing? Yeah, so it, it's quite a few pieces. So the, the, if you're going to test someone for COVID, there's a few things you need. You need someone to take the specimen, which is a healthcare provider. Mm -hmm. uh, their time is going to be at a premium, certainly. You need PPE for that healthcare provider. So that's a limiting factor. You need a special swab that's sterile to be able to get the specimen. Those are hard to find now. And then once you take that swab, you need chemicals to run the tests on the equipment. And now those chemicals are, we're having limitations on. Damn. And, and you need laboratory staff to do that too. So, um, and the, these have to happen in certified laboratories where you can be 100% confident or close, as close to that as you can and the test result you're getting. Um, so there, there's limitations across that pipeline. Got it. Um, there's a question about the, and I don't even know what this is, so I'd love to know your thought. The, if you've read the AEI roadmap for reopening parts of the country, and do you think it's a reasonable plan on how you phase out social distancing? What is that? Yeah, I, I haven't had a chance to read through the whole thing yet, but um, I've skimmed through it, and I'm, I'm very excited by what's in there. Um, what does I'm it gonna, say? Like, do you I'm can... look to that tonight. Um, so a, a lot of um, I, I don't want to speak to the specifics without having looked through it um, specifically, but essentially thinking about different phases of where we're going to be in this epidemic. I mean, mm -hmm. if, we're, if we're all taking this time at home, that's going to impact where, where a peak would happen, when a peak would happen. Um, mm -hmm. Essentially thinking about different public health actions we would want to take at those different phases. So now, if we're all staying home, Let's invest a lot of time and energy into getting testing ramped up 
as high as we can get it, get hospitals as well equipped as they can. Um, and then uh, as we start moving into a next phase, then we're gonna start deploying that testing and really trying to track down every single case. Um, mm -hmm. Now we're almost more doing num counting numbers just to get a sense of where things are. And then mm -hmm. when we feel like we're prepared and ready, then we can start going after every single case and hammering it into the ground. Got it. I heard a rumor that Truvada is, because it's an antiretroviral, it's good for preventing getting COVID. Is that true? Um, we, I haven't seen anything around that. That's, I've, I've heard similar rumors too. That's, I, it, it hasn't been evaluated scientifically. What, what, what rumor are you hearing that is the most harmful that's still getting out in the public that you'd want to quash? Um, that, that this is similar to seasonal flu. Um, the, in my mind, you, we, we can talk all day until we're blue in the face and people will still be debating in three decades from now what some of the exact numbers are on number of people who died or percentage of mortality. But um, to, to my eye, this virus has very clearly declared what it is and what it's capable of by every major way I would evaluate that. And we see that in China, we've seen it in Italy. It can make enough people sick that it brings very well-sourced healthcare systems to its knees mm -hmm. uh, with, and requires entire societal investment in being able to stop it unless mm -hmm. we have vaccines come online. Mm -hmm. so that's, th th those are unequivocal in my mind. There, there is a much much to argue with there. Um, so that it, in, in my mind, it's clear what follows from that is these are the steps we need to take if we want to prevent those infections. Mm -hmm. This is going to be the last question. And it's kind of, uh, we're, we're going to be interviewing some ER doctors, some, some, some folks on the front lines as well. But um, I think one of the things that is scariest about this is it's, I'm hearing that even if you're really healthy and even if you don't have an underlying issue, like there was just a report of a gay man in the Miami area who's 40 yeah. years old, who was super healthy, had no problems. And he just like, it basically, he couldn't breathe. They put him on a ventilator and it just like yeah. didn't work. And he stopped breathing and he died in like a matter of days. And so yeah. is, is there any, in the medical community, is anyone understood what would result in someone not being able to have a good result from this versus someone who dies within a matter of days? I mean, how do you know what's going to happen? So we, we currently don't have good signals on that. So obviously, I'm sure everyone's familiar, you know, the older you are, the, the worst outcomes we're seeing on average. But I do, that that's one thing that I feel like the media has run with a little bit too much as well. And what, what you're reflecting is a reality that we've been seeing since the beginning, where we are seeing, and not to the same numbers, but really bad outcomes for yeah. perfectly healthy 20-somethings, 30-somethings. Even for yeah. some who survive, if they're going to the hospital, they, they may be in an induced coma for a week on a ventilator. Like that, yeah. that, that's something really exceptional for a young, healthy individual to take on. Yeah. In environment. Yeah. Holy um, moly. And the, the, that's not everybody. People are having completely asymptomatic infections too. Um, and, but we don't have an idea of what at the individual level is driving those differences and otherwise apparently healthy people. But there's a lot of work research being done on that now so i did you see we work with ucsf now on some of that um, okay last question what is something that you've seen on the front lines that is encouraging you and that is giving you hope yeah so i i think honestly the most encouraging thing to me is the what we're seeing at the population level that communities are buying in to this idea that we need this collective effort to be able to make an impact. Um, and obviously not everyone is buying into that. Um, 
but it, it's been pretty remarkable to me. I mean, like, let's just all acknowledge that this is not a world any of us probably would have imagined three months right. ago. And that, that's a really short time yeah. frame for people to get on board and start making those adjustments. Yeah. The, the adaptability of people to take that on, I've, I've been really impressed with yeah. so far. Well, Patrick, uh, I wanna thank you so much. Uh, for the folks who are tuning in, please go ahead in the chat box and you can click on joinit.org slash o slash Manny's to become a sponsor of Manny's. We need the help. I know a lot of organizations need the help, but we're providing this, uh, these conversations for the public for free as a service and we could really use your financial support to keep it going. Thank you to the operator, Sam, for putting that link in the chat box. Um, Patrick, it's, it's so great. It's been great. It was great getting to know you on the soccer field. You were my <laughs> captain on the soccer team. People, I, I have him saved in my phone as so Patrick Soccer. Uh, he's a very good soccer player um, and also a great captain and also a great uh, you know doctor. And I'm glad that CZI has, uh, the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub has hired you and that you're, you're on the front lines and you're working on this. Um, stay safe, stay healthy, stay energized. Um, yeah, likewise, and Manny. What? Likewise, Manny. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying. I'm here. Um, and, and also, folks, tag us at Welcome to Manny's. And what website can people go to to find about about your work, Patrick? Um, CZ Biohub is best. We, we CZBiohub.com. All right, everyone. Thank you. Go. See you soon. Bye-bye. Woop, 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 woop